30s. Here's a picture of what this house looked like in the 30s, and you can tell that it's nothing, they're two, they're two pages. Nothing looks like the way it does today. told around from the research that I've done around 1828 it has the style um, you know they, they had the porches onto the side right so the top part is exactly what it was to look like you know so it had that little peak uh, if you go back to uh, North Carolina you know, most of these people came from North Carolina here in Virginia right and so this had a, a North Carolinian look and so uh, you can tell from the two pictures we have here this is the south view, and then we're going to carry you around to the north. And it actually, there are two fronts. Exactly. Two fronts <laughs> to this house. So, kind of quickly, Bob Gamble, who is an architectural historian, retired mm -hmm. from the Alabama Historical Commission, says this house may be the finest example of antebellum architecture in the entire Tennessee Valley. And one of the most important in the state of Alabama. So the preservation of this house is very important. So it is originally federal style. Now that's what you're seeing in the photographs that were taken. And the federal style was the style popular in the 1820s and into the middle 1830s. Okay, so what you've got here is actually a big box. The forks was a big box, remember? Yeah. Without the forks and the court yeah. Alright, now. You'll notice in the picture that it had two side porches on here. You see that? Yeah. Well, they were taken off later. So, <laughs> so we know that eventually this man, Dr. Coulter, moved on to the west, somewhere in the Mississippi Valley. And George Washington Foster, who was the builder owner of Corpview, the house that sits in the middle of Court Street up by UNA, he bought it for his daughter and son-in-law. Now, they were Mr. and Mrs. James Bennington Irvin. Many of you went out into the uh, cemetery with me, and Irvin was one of the most prominent lawyers in town. Okay? And he was living there in the Simpson house at that time, which is they Kobe Hall. So, uh, so the Irvin son marries the daughter of the Fosters, who are next door neighbors, kind of. Now, is it, does that window pane still exist in there with Irvin? Yeah, supposedly it still does. I saw it. It's, it's, it's like in the, in the far, back and to the end. left. <laughs> North end, excuse me. She took her diamond ring and put her initials in that window back there. <laughs> now, but it didn't last very long. She didn't like it because she said it was too far out of town. Hmm. Yeah. And don't forget, town then was about where the courthouse is. <laughs> See, that's town. Yeah. And she missed her mother. Now, uh, so as you can see, this fascia is south, and then we'll go around the other side in a minute. And at one time, before all this other construction, you could see the river. All the way to the river and as far east of, of, of maybe Patton Island, when it was open. You could see how open it was in the 30s, that, that picture. Now, we also notice that it is a two-story over a full basement. And as we go around, we're going to go this way, I'm going to show you, but that wing right there, was, at, was, a, was an outside part of that wing was the outside kitchen. And you'll see where they connected it later. So that was the outdoor kitchen. This is one of the few houses I know of around here that has an original kitchen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when they, when they joined the house and the kitchen, they closed in the breezeway. Okay. So that became a modern kitchen later for people to so the next owner was Dr. Levi Todd of Kentucky. He was uh, listed as a physician slash planter, okay? Uh, 
and cousin to Mary Todd Lincoln. We talked about that in the centipede. Todd owned the house throughout the Civil War and saw the town and this house change hands many times. Uh, I think I told you, or I didn't tell you because it's in the next class, but from the beginning of the Civil War to the end of the Civil War, Florence changed hands 44 times. 44. <laughs> and as one of the foster daughters wrote, you had to be careful what you said because you need to look outside and see which flag is flying there before you say it. Now, in 1862, uh, Union Colonel John Marshall Harlan took over this house. It was the common practice that when the army came into town, particularly the Confederate Army, they would often the commanders would be invited to stay in a certain house. But when the Union Army came in, it was an act of intimidation. So they would take over the most prominent families' homes, particularly the homes of Confederate officers. Okay? Now, Dr. Todd is not in the Confederates, but this home is one of the most prominent homes in town. So Marshall, John Marshall Harlan, by the way, who went on to become a justice on the Supreme Court, he was a commander of the 10th Kentucky, and it was him who ordered the arrest and imprisonment of Reverend Mitchell of First Presbyterian Church, the pastor of your church. Because Reverend Mitchell got up in church with those Union soldiers sitting in the front and started a prayer for the Confederacy. They literally hauled him out in chains and imprisoned him in a prison in one of the islands of Ohio. And he stayed there for eight months before he was brought home. Now, the story goes, makes a great story whether it's true or not. Sometimes you got to be careful. <laughs> the story goes that he takes the pulpit when he gets back on the first Sunday back, and there are Union soldiers in the audience, and this is what he said. I had a prayer that was rudely interrupted, and I will begin it again. <laughs> and he prayed it through. So the, the intimidation was practical. It worked at, it was working all throughout the South doing this kind of thing. So, so we know that after the war, we don't really know what happened to Dr. Todd. Well, he died, he's buried in our cemetery, as is one of his sisters. But I think the other sister went back to Kentucky. Prior, uh, after the war, it became the home of Major Robert McFarland. And of course, we all know McFarland Bottom is named for him. Um, he was an attorney prior to the war and established a practice in Florence here after the war. During the war, he served first under General Stonewall Jackson in Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. And after the death of Stonewall Jackson, he was then served in the cavalry of John Hunt Morgan. Now, if you don't know who that is, the South had what they call three of the Great Raiders. The Great Raiders are, were also known as the Wizards of the South. They were Morgan, Mosby, and Forrest. And two of those men rode horses from the forts. Okay? Dr. and Mrs. Uh, Dr. and Mrs. Robert Slayton became the next owners, and they began the restoration of the house. They're the ones that changed the exterior to what you see today. And it is Mrs. Slayton that called it Mapleton because of her family home in Louisville, Kentucky. This would have been, what, uh, the teens or 20s? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Uh, was he a physician or a dentist? I, I don't know. He's the one that built this addition here as his medical office. It would have been the dentist. The dentist, <clears throat> okay. And that would have been like right now, the teens? Either teens or the, well, you'll notice that this picture was taken in the 30s, so it had to have been after that picture was taken. It's in the 40s. The 40s, all right. So we go. <laughs> we have a memory here. Was he a dentist? Oh. There you go. There you go. So that tells us, well, I tell you what, I ran across this. Someone in the McFarland family was still living here in 1943. I forgot to tell you. They were still living here in 43. So you're right. It had to be after 43. So that medical office was a practice here for a long time. So it is her, Mrs. Slayton, who named it at Mapleton. Now, 
Mapleton. Now, while it was while it belonged to Coulter, it was Coulter's Hall or Coulter's Hill, and when it belonged to Todd, it was Todd's Hill. But the name Mapleton is given. Now, I've been told by a lot of people who have not been around Florence a long time that originally none of the townhouses had names. They were just named after the owner. Well, the practice of naming houses like Mapleton or Thimbleton or Courtview or Hickory Place or Crowley Hall came later. Okay, so those names were not original. So, uh, and I guess the Campbells, who were, uh, the Campbells were, the, were relatives of the Dr. Slayton and his wife. They bought it next. And then uh, Sam and Susan Warren, and that's when Dr. Mancuso bought it off of the Warrens, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. Correct. So you can see the ch chasing of the, who owns this place. So Coulter, and then down the line. So if you would, um, somebody, Has that book. We're going to go this direction. The fountain that you'll see, we put that in. That uh, is a copy of an 1862 uh, fountain. And the neat he part. called me back and said, Yeah, this is not doing anything for me. I want a pedestal. So I told him that I had a bunch of limestone rock from the forks. So that limestone you see around the base is all from the forks. Oh, wow. So the remnant of that. Right. See it? Yeah. Notice the elaborate work around the window. This federal style woodwork is incredible. I ran across a statement that says the original owner was from Kentucky. And there are a lot of these houses in Kentucky, and perhaps he might have brought some of the artisans to do the work from Kentucky. Because you know, you're in the frontier of Alabama, and there's just not a lot of think about the forks, how they got all that work done at forks without some sort of artisan help, maybe from Nashville or somewhere. So go around this way. Just be careful. See, and each room would have had a fireplace, and each fire, each chimney would have held three fireplaces. Now this is the original kitchen, but notice it's been added to. Notice this wing here by Billy. This is modern brick. So these are bathrooms. Down there, what we call back fall to bottom, all the way to Cypress Creek. Now, I don't know if that meant he owned everything also this way from on this hillside. Do you know? Do you, you have any acres? Yeah, do you have a clue of how many acres went with the place? I ran across one figure that when <laughs> he bought the place, it was in excess of 150 acres. So that could have been late. That could have gone that way, this way. Now, don't forget, directly across from him, on, on, on the other side of uh, where the Holiday Inn used to be, was John McKinley's house, who was, I need to correct this, the first man from Alabama on the U.S. Supreme Court. Hugo Black was appointed later under FDR. So McKinley's home was also a very dominant house facing the river. I, and I only, I've only seen one picture of it. So that's why they, this hazmat, hazmat, they never got into that house to take pictures in the 30s because it didn't exist. Okay, so this is the north view. And if you look at it, it's as pretty, almost as pretty as the south. Yes, it is. Yeah. So you would have had an entrance in either place. Quite an amazing place. I think, you know, because Dr. Mancuso owns it, but I think he bought it because of its great view. You don't, you just don't see this. It's still in existence. That old. I know. If I it's know. 1828 yeah. to 1830, think about it. Yeah. It's about 200 years old. It's getting close to 200 years old. And look, at, it's still in great shape. So this, these artisans knew what they were doing. So do you have any questions about...
what you're seeing or anything Dr. Mancuso can answer? You got anything you want to add? Thank you, Dr. Mancuso. Oh, thank you. Thanks thank for you. coming. Be careful. Turn it down. 